Yeah, I know. I, I wondered for a moment myself, you know, if there was a transcendent dimension to it. <laughs> yeah. And now that any pretensions towards decorum have been <laughs> totally dissipated, we'll begin. Uh, before I introduce our, our speaker this morning, I'd just say that we were remiss last night in neglecting to mention um, the McKinnon Lectures, which take place in a couple of weeks, October the 16th to the 18th, at uh, the Atlantic School of Theology. And the McKinnon Lectures, are, the theme is Ecumenism at the Crossroads, and the, uh, the lecturer will be uh, Father Jean-Marie Tillard, who is a Dominican priest uh, from St. Pierre and Miquelon. He has uh, taught in, at the University of Ottawa at Laval and also in Brussels, um, Oxford, and in Freiburg, Switzerland. He was a uh, theological advisor at the Second Vatican Council and is a member of both the Anglican Roman Catholic Commission and the Roman Catholic Orthodox Commission. So he's been quite active for a long time in, in ecumenical circles. Uh, he's a, a well-known figure in ecumenism, and so we just wanted to um, point that out to you. As If you enjoy these kinds of things, well, there's another one coming up in a couple of weeks. And now it's my pleasure to, uh, to briefly introduce our, our speaker this morning. Um, Father Robert Ferris, hails from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, he's a member of the Society of Jesus. He is a professor at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Last night in his talk, he described himself as a recovering theologian. And he is a noted author and lecturer. In my chats with people around here in the few days that he's been here, he's also been cited a number of times as a character. And so I think you'll, I think you'll have no trouble uh, not only listening to him, but enjoying listening to him this morning. Father Pharisee. Yesterday morning I had a telephone interview with a young woman journalist who apparently had written out the questions she wanted to ask me, maybe seven or eight uh, excellent questions, many of them about Zen meditation and Eastern cultures and Eastern religions. And I found myself, the questions were so good, and they were quite uh, intellectual questions, and they were good ones. I found myself uh, almost helplessly inarticulate. I had a lot of difficulty. We talked for 45, 48 minutes, actually, and I can't remember a thing I said. <laughs> but I remember everything she said because I know I said, uh, a number of times I said, uh, dumb. <laughs> but outside of that, and it convinced me of the ineffability of mystical experience. Up until recent times, most Christian theologians in the area of comparative mysticism, and that's what we're talking about. I'm going to talk about Zen meditation from the point of view, really, of a Christian, a Catholic, and even, God help us all, Jesuit theologian. I'm going to talk about it from my own point of view. It's the only point of view I have. And there is so we're talking here about mystical experience, necessarily. Up until recently, there was a theory that you can't talk about mystical experience because it's ineffable. Now, there are still a lot of people that hold that, but they keep talking about it. Even if all they say is that it's ineffable, they're talking about it, aren't they? So it's not so ineffable after all. I think there is a weak ineffability, and it, make it, it makes it very difficult to articulate mystical experience, whether you're talking about contemplative prayer in the Christian tradition, Zen meditation, or anything in any religious tradition, it's difficult to talk about. And because of that idea, up until recently, that all mystical experience is ineffable and we can't talk about it, there was also the, the corresponding um, common idea that all mystical experience is the same. 
And even if it's not, we can't find out because it's so ineffable we can't talk about it. But anyway, we don't have to talk about it because it's all the same. You're a Hindu mystic, I'm a Christian mystic, or I'm a Buddhist mystic, you're a Sufi mystic, a Muslim, same thing. Well now, that worm has turned. And very few people younger than I am, a lot of guys older than me though, there are, there are fewer and fewer every year, but a lot of guys older than me are still saying that, that it's all the same. But the younger people, younger, is, that means people younger than you always, doesn't it? So the under 70s, they are saying that uh, they're not all the same. Not all mystical experience is the same. I would go even further, see. I would say mystical, mystical experience is very diverse, not just among religions, but within a given religion, and not just uh, diverse among currents in the same religion, like different kinds of Buddhism or different Christian denominations. I'd say mystical experience is very different depending on the persons. Different people have different experiences. It's very diverse. And yet, see, in all mystical experience, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, there are some, a lot of very important and even essential commonalities. There are some kernels of, of likeness and almost, you might, I would say, identity that make all or most, I don't want to be too general here, most of what passes for mystical experience to be remarkably similar. But different religions and different currents in the same general religious category have different faith presuppositions, different styles, different outlooks. Okay, so there you are. It's not all black and white. Are, is all mystical experience the same? Yes and no. No, and then kind of. All right. So if that confuses you a little bit, let me confuse you even more. The, when you talk about Zen meditation, what I found in, in studying Buddhism and in particular um, meditation and in particular Zen meditation is that the cultural differences are simply enormous. They are enormous. I think we have a lot of cultural, we, North Americans, we have a lot of, and Europeans, of course, the Europeans think that all North Americans are just like them. <laughs> and so we have to tell them we're not just like you, sorry. But it's because there are differences there too. But there are differences between, say, the Portuguese and the Finnish, or between uh, Americans or Canadians and Italians. Those differences are minimal compared to what we all share and the cultures of of the of the Far East. I can go to Bombay, a place or uh, some place in northern India, and not feel so and, and feel pretty much at home. I understand it. They talk. I know what they're talking about. Even the languages, you can learn a word here and a word there. In the Gujarati, you can say a few words. It's not that difficult. But in Japan, it's harder. And Japan, of course, is very westernized. In Korea, the differences are simply immense. The Koreans think they're westernized because they have a highly technological, very economically, and very socially developed culture. And they've made great strides in the last 25, 35 years. And they're westernized only in that sense. Their culture is unique. Korean culture is unique, and, so, and Jap Japanese is also very different. I just, I find, all right, I learned Spanish as a boy. It took me a year to learn Latin so that I could speak it. It took me uh, five months to learn French so that I could stumble along. It took me five weeks to learn Italian so that I could get by. I could make simple conversation in Romanian after two weeks. I studied Korean for eight months, and I am nowhere. It's a whole different way of looking at reality. 
I approach the Korean language looking for subjects, predicates, and a little grammar. They, none of the above. None of the above. Not to mention the writing. They think it's simple because they got their own alphabet. Why don't they have ours, right? Why can't, why can't the Koreans be more like me? Because they're Korean and they have their own unique culture and they know it's unique. When I got into Korean Zen, I felt at home because I understood it. it and, and when I approached the cultural differences, between my culture, whatever that might be, I was born in, Amer in the United States, so I suppose I'm an American. And I guess that's my basic culture. That's what I grew up with, although I grew up in the woods there in Minnesota. We don't have a lot of culture. <laughs> no, even a lot of imagination. In northern Minnesota, all the dogs have the same name. You know what they're called? Dog. <laughs> All the cats have the same name. They're called cat. We only have two seasons, right, in Minnesota. Um, winter and road work. That's all. <laughs> well, cultural differences are terrific. And when you talk about Zen, I'm going to be talking about these. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding between... Uh, ecumenical misunderstanding between Christians and Buddhists in general and between uh, Christians and Zen Buddhists in particular there's just a lot there's just a lot okay so let's start let's get to the concrete part here I want to talk about my own experience with Buddhism and particularly with Zen and particularly with Korean Zen and then I'll be talking out of my own experience and it might be more valuable because when you're talking about Zen meditation or Christian contemplation or Sufi meditation or anything, anything in that area, anything in the area of mystical experience, because that's what we're talking about. You may not like the word, but that's what it's called, mystical experience. So I'm going to use it. When you're talking about that, it's not the same thing as talking about dogmatic theology or theology of the church or theology of justification those things you can deal with abstract concepts but when you're talking about mysticism meditation contemplation you're dealing with experience and so it's more descriptive and less metaphysical there is no metaphysics of mystical experience that i know of maybe there is but i haven't found it meister eckhart i guess has one but it's pretty messy and nobody ever knew what he was talking about even today which is why a lot of people like them. They like uh, theologians have become famous by writing things that are absolutely incomprehensible. <laughs> what I did, I, I, I mean, I might as well admit it because it's a small group. I got interested in Buddhism because I felt the Lord leading me to get interested in Buddhism. That's why. I, and I had no reason and no motive except that my field of spiritual theology and I've been teaching courses on uh, prayer and contemplation for a long time at the graduate level in Rome. And so I thought I should branch out here and learn. And I had studied Hinduism, but Hinduism is a whole world. And everything you say to, to the Hindu experts, they all say, yes, yes, you're right and we're right. Everybody's right. It's all Hinduism. <laughs> no, it's not. Yes, it is. We have room for everything. Blessed Virgin Mary, sacraments, good, fine. We accept that. So it's a little hard to deal with. But I thought, well, now I'll learn something about Buddhism. They seem to be a little more precise. And, and they are, as a matter of fact. And so I went to different places and talked to a lot of people and I and, and tried things, actually, when I found out that the only way... You, I, I found out that what I really wanted to know was about Zen meditation. And so some of the big Catholic experts, most of them, in fact, are members of my own order, Jesuits. And a number of them, three or four, uh, are or have been, were in my time at Sophia, Sophia University in Tokyo. So I went there and talked to them, and I talked to a lot of Buddhists, and I went to Kyoto and Japan and Bangkok and Korea and all kinds of places. And I even tried different kinds of Zen. So you've got the two most 
well-known kinds of Zen Buddhism and therefore Zen meditation in North America and Europe are called uh, tell me if you can't see this Soto is one can you see it? Soto and the other one is called Renzai and I honestly gave them my best shot Looks like graffiti, doesn't it? I used to be a graffiti artist. No, I didn't. So I gave them, a, I tried Soto. Soto Zen is called just sitting. And pretty much what you do is just sit there. That's about it. But there's more to it. It's an, they say that it's very passive, but it's not really very passive. It's an actively emptying your mind. This has something to do with what Christians call poverty of spirit and lack of inordinate attachments and detachment. So it's not entirely passive. I don't have the patience for it, to tell you the truth. I sat there for a while and I thought, to hell with this. <laughs> and I got up. So the limitation is in me, not in Soto Zen, but I knew that wasn't my style. So then I, I talked to uh, the Jesuit Zen master, K.T. Kadawaki, in, at Sophia University, and he thought I seemed like a promising person, and so he tried to teach me some Renzai Zen. But uh, I didn't have patience for that either, because I'm sort of a fidgeter, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a patient person. So I thought, well, I can still study Zen. It's not for me, but I'll study it. So I, I was in Korea maybe four or five times for different reasons. And I met a fellow named uh, a Buddhist monk, a great teacher of meditation, who, is in who was in fact born in Canada, in Vancouver, and who is an Irish, was an Irish Catholic, but converted to Buddhism and became a, a very important Zen teacher in, in Seoul. So I went to see him, and we got along great, and he told me a lot of things, and he said, why don't we share our meditation and contemplation? Why don't, you tell me what you do, and I'll tell you what I do. So I thought that was a good idea, and we liked each other. We obviously had a lot in common. Uh, so we, we did share, and at the end he said, we're doing the same thing. And I said, no, we're not. And now I know the truth is somewhere in between. Maybe closer to him, to what he said, than closer to what I said. So then I left Korea, and I was preparing to go a second time, and I was doing some work at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and I went to the library, and I didn't want to start work. I know none of you have ever had that feeling, but... I do a lot of work in libraries, and I, I usually begin my work by just getting up and kind of moseying around and seeing what's interesting and looking at the stacks, and then I have my alarm set for 10.15 in the morning, so when that goes off, I think, ooh, it's 10.15, I better start work. So I was in the Loyola Marymount Library, browsing around in the stacks, trying to avoid getting my work done, and I ran across this book, uh, the, way, the Korean Way of Zen, by Kusan Sunim. Sunim is the reverential, like Rinpoche or Rashi. It's, uh, Sunim means uh, the reverend Kusan, and Kusan means uh, two mountains or three mountains. So there I am uh, reading this book, and it tells how Korean Zen differs from Japanese Zen, differs from Soto, and it's a, it's a kind of Renzai. Korean Zen is sort of like Renzai, That stands for Korean, but I don't have room. Korean Zen is like Renzai in that you get a koan, which in Korean is koan, and but they usually call it a hwadu. It's like, it's a koan, so I'm going to call it a koan. You get a koan from your Zen master, 
in Renzai, and it's a riddle. Like uh, in Japanese Renzai, he, you're supposed to sit there cross-legged and you're, you meditate for the whole rest of your life on this koan. What is it? Well, it's a nonsense thing. Like, the, um, what is the sound of one hand clapping? The cypress in the courtyard. That's another one. Or it could be something like uh, the plum tree is blooming. So you meditate on this. And the whole point is you're not going to get anywhere. That's the point. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to meditate on it. It blocks It blocks reasoning. You're meditating on this thing. And medita- it's not a mantra. You don't, it's not something you just repeat, the cypress in the courtyard, the cypress in the courtyard. No. You're, you're penetrating. this. It's like a riddle. It's like a riddle. What's the answer? There is no answer. But it blocks conceptual thinking. And it blocks any conceptual endeavor. So you're in a non-conceptual state. It's like the rosary does the same thing. Or ejaculatory prayer saying, my Jesus mercy over and over and over and over all your life. It blocks rational thinking and it can get you into in Christianity into contemplative prayer. And in Renzai Zen, it gets you into meditation, non-conceptual meditation. You might say, what's the point? Well, that's another question, but that's what they do. Korean Zen is more aggressive. Korean Zen is a form of Renzai, but instead of something like the cypress in the courtyard, it asks an aggressive question. What is air? Who am I? What is the sky? Or you can take something like the cypress in the courtyard, but you attack it aggressively. You ask the question, the cypress in the courtyard, what does that mean? So there's more of an aggressivity. Uh, That's not their word, that's my word. There's a questioning of the koan in Korean Zen. And I read that in this book, right? I'm reading about this. And that appealed to me. I thought, okay, I'm an aggressive person. I'm a fidgeter. I'd never make it in Soto. I'm too impatient for Japanese Renzai. Maybe I can do this. But I got to find a Zen master to give me a koan. And so I can try Korean Zen. Right? I think I can do that. So I didn't have a Zen master. And I couldn't find one there in the Loyola Marymount Los Angeles University Library. So I prayed. And I said to Jesus, hey, you're better than a Zen master, so give me a koan, please. So he gave me one. And the one he gave me was, who are you? He gave me that. Meaning him. Who's he, right? So my koan was a question. It was a relational question, a directional question. Not just thinking, uh, why is the sky blue or something. But who is he? Jesus. Now, that also... I can meditate on that and ask that aggressively all day long. I'm never going to get the answer because, for one thing, he's God, and God is, uh, as I learned in catechism, an infinite being. I can know, I used to think he was a vegetable. He's an infinite being. I can know more and more about him and never fully understand him. That's true of Jesus, too. So I thought that was a pretty good koan. So I thought, okay, and I'm sitting there in the library. I think, here goes. So I said, who are you? And wham, I was filled with what Jesuits call consolation. I was filled with joy. I was, I was, I had this big experience, this huge experience, as soon as I got into it, immediately. So I thought, holy Moses, this thing is great. So I kept on going, and I was on a high, and uh, whenever I use my koan, I'm back on it. I have elements of that same experience. It's wonderful. I verified this later with Do Gong, the, the fellow that I had met, the man from Vancouver, and he said, you had a real, that was, th- that was it. That was the big enlighten, a big enlightenment experience. Well, I thought, Do Gong's a nice guy, he likes me, so I checked it with another fellow, another Zen master in uh, South Korea, and he said, yeah, that's, that's it. You had a big enlightenment experience. So then I had asked myself some questions. How come all these Zen monks practice Zen for years and years and years and finally they have this big experience? I'm sitting there in the library reading a book. I go boff and bang. I get the big experience right away. 
something's wrong here. Why is that? And I think the answer is that I had already been uh, practicing Christian prayer for almost 50 years. I'd been, I'd, I'd been around the block on this thing, right? So that I had our, so that when I got into Zen, it clicked right away because I had already been meditating in my own tradition for so many years, an hour or more every day, not including mass and breviary and all the rest of it all. And rosaries, I'm, a bit, I'm sort of a rosary fanatic. Don't hate me. But I think it's great. I, I say the rosary of the angels and the rosary of the precious blood and the 15 decades. I do the whole number. Okay. So I'd been doing all this for years, right? So, sure, when I got into Zen, whammo, it hit me right away because I had all that background. I, and that is an indication to me that what I had been doing up until Korean Zen, and once I got into it, they weren't all that different. So anyway, I kept on with my koan off and on, sometimes, pretty erratically, I have to admit. And then I went to Korea, where I was a guest lecturer in the Graduate School of Sogang University for a while. So I was there for an academic year. And at the end of the academic year, I had some time, quite a bit of time. So I went south after making the necessary arrangements. And I went to the central monastery of the Chogye Order of Korea. Background. I'm not going to give you all the historical background. There's a lot of it. But the Chogye Order practically is the center of Buddhism in Korea. Korea is a big country, like 50, 50 plus million. And it's a developed country. It's hardly the third world, by no means. The big religion is Buddhism, still. Christian the Buddhists are a little discouraged because Christianity is booming. And there are a lot of Christians, Catholic, Protestant, all kinds, Pentecostal, in, uh, in South Korea, and it's booming. And it, the really chic thing to do is to become a Christian, and a lot of people do. And they're good. The Catholic Church, for example, has great leadership in South Korea. And it, it's, it's booming. And there are lots of religious vocations, lots of them, to the Jesuits, to the Dominicans, to the sisters. It's, it's uh, everything everywhere. It's just going great. And you might say, well, yeah, but what kind of Catholicism is it? It's wonderful. I think it's a very alive, very vigorous church. Buddhism is not quite as vigorous and not quite as alive, but it's still important. It is, in the Zen tradition, the most important uh, Buddhist religious order, the Chogye order. Korean Zen, there are thousands and thousands of Korean nuns and co Korean uh, monks, that thousands of them, that get up in monasteries all over the Republic of South Korea at a quarter to three every morning, and that pray for two or three hours, that meditate for two or three hours, and that live the life, and they really do it. I would say that Zen Buddhism in Japan has fallen on very hard times. I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say that it's kind of decadent. But in Korea, it's a lie. The irony is that the, the Zen that we know in North America is mostly Soto and Renzai, and Korean culture is so diverse that it never really uh, got into North America or into Europe. Now there are a few foundations, but they're just beginning. But Korean Zen is alive and well in Korea, and I, find, I found out that it worked for me. So I went to this monastery, Song Songguang Sa, which means Songguang Monastery. It's, it's up on a mountain with some higher mountains above it, but it's up on a mountain in uh, South Korea between Seoul and the coast, in the, in the center, in the hills. It's a big monastery. I went there, I was there for about two or three days, and then as planned, I moved up to where this Zen master, this great Zen teacher uh, named Chung, San Sunim, which means many, many mountains, Reverend Many, Many Mountains, who turned out to be a man very much like myself, uh, sort of a active, aggressive, fidgeting type of person. 
and I was happy to meet him to find out that n not all Zen masters were sort of calm and peaceful all the time. He was peaceful, but he wasn't always calm. Anyway, he got me, and he and I, and his disciple, another, a young Zen monk of the Chogye order, lived in a, we lived in a hermitage for an extended period of time. I just made a big, long retreat, and I did Zen up there for maybe between 10 and 11 hours a day. It was quite an experience. I'm going to tell you about it. When I got there, I brought a little mass kit with myself. I thought I'd say mass in my room. Of course, there are people don't sit on chairs, right? They sit on the floor, and the floor is heated. It's a whole different world. It's like being on Neptune or somewhere. But anyway, I could sit there on the floor and with my little low coffee table type of thing in my little cell, and I could say mass. So I told the Zen master, I said, uh, uh, what am I supposed to do? He said, what, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do Zen. He said, how many hours were you planning? Well, normally when I make the spiritual exercise of the St. Ignatius, you pray four times a day for an hour each time, four hours. So I said, I don't know, I want to do the whole thing. What would you recommend? He said, do it all the time. I said, okay, 10, 11 hours? Good, he said, all right. So that's what I did. I said, also, I'm a Catholic priest. It turned out he'd never really met a Catholic priest before. He didn't know anything about Catholic priests. He didn't say that, but I picked it up. So I, I said, I say Mass every day. Oh, yeah, I said, uh, hmm, how long does it take? I said, 25 minutes. Oh, how much noise do you make? <laughs> I said, I don't make any noise. Okay, he said, go ahead. He had no idea what I was doing. But so that's what I did. I said Mass. I read a little uh, Korean Zen philosophy for about... 30 minutes a day, and the rest I prayed between 10 and 11 hours. I, made my, I did my Zen. I, I get up at a quarter to three with uh, the other two guys, and we'd go up to uh, a little chapel on top of the hermitage to kind of to, to do what they do. Should I tell you this? I guess I will. Anyway, we're up there, and they got this Buddha of... Uh, that they call Kwam Seyum. It's canon in Japanese. Some of you are familiar with it. It's, it's a usually feminine Buddha or Bodhisattva, kind of a saint Buddha, something like that. But it's feminine. And usually canon or Kwam Seyum is standing. This one was seated and it was beautiful. It was it's my favorite Buddha, this particular one in the hermitage on top of the mountain above the monastery in South Korea. And so these guys, they get up and they kneel down, they bow to this Buddha, and then they bang the drum and, and they sing some, like, psalms, right? Sutras in Korean. Well, my Korean wasn't good enough, and I didn't know the sutras. So I prayed in tongues, because I'm a charismatic Catholic, right? And they didn't know what I was doing, but I did, so that was fine. And I, I bowed. Later, uh, the sin master, many mountains, he said to me, We've had a few Protestant ministers up here. They don't bow to the Buddha, but you do. You bow to Kwam Seum. Yeah, I said, uh, I do. I didn't tell him that for me, I really liked it so much that I decided that for me it was a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I was bowing to the Blessed Virgin Mary and praying in tongues with her to God when they were singing their sutras. But anyway, I did the drill. And then we'd go down into the meditation room and we'd sit there cross-legged for like several hours. So you just sit there and do your thing. Meditate on your koan. And my koan was, who are you? And then after a while, the other two guys would get up and they'd go about their business because they weren't praying 10 or 11 hours a day, but I was. So I was in there all the time, and when you got tired of sitting, you'd get up and you'd walk real slow, do a kind of a Buddhist walk like that. And you just keep hitting your... Uh, I just kept asking the Lord, uh, not frantically, but meditating on who are you well it was really something it was the best retreat I ever made it was the best retreat I ever made I was with the Lord the whole time I was with him the whole time and he led me through the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius which I had no intention of making because I was doing Zen but I made them if you're familiar with the exercises you start with the foundation you do the, the first part on sin then you do the kingdom about uh, answering the call. Jesus calls me and I answer. 
and then you go through the public life of the Lord and some other meditations and the passion and the resurrection and then you're, you're done. I did though. I did the whole thing. He led me right through the spiritual exercises and I wasn't trying to do them at all. And I didn't do them explicitly, but I, I followed the dynamic of the exercises perfectly. I, I'd been doing them every year since I entered the Jesuits, so maybe that has something to do with it psychologically. But I think that's how the Lord led me. But he, he respected the fact that I was doing this Zen thing and meditating on this koan, asking him who he was. And from time to time, he'd tell me. I mean, I never had so much spiritual fireworks in, in my prayer or in a retreat. It was everything, everywhere. All kinds of things were going on. So it worked, to be brief. I did Zen, and it worked. And every second or third day, I talked to the Zen master. And I said to him, the first day I said, there's quite a bit going on here. Oh yeah, he said, what's going on? I said, well, the Lord is speaking to me and telling me all different things. He's answering my, my koan with inadequate and partial answers, but they're still, he's talking to me. I'm, I'm so much in touch with him that he's, he's speaking to me a lot. Oh, that didn't phase the Zen master for a second. Not a bit. He said, uh, well, he said, don't hang on to that. When those things happen, you just let that go. And you just keep right on with your koan. Which, of course, is exactly the advice that any Catholic spiritual director gives. That's John of the Cross. And I told him that. I said, that's, uh, that's the same advice that John of the Cross gives. Don't get attached to any experiences you have in your prayer because the experiences are not God. So don't get attached to them. You want to be attached to the Lord, but not to the experiences, which was just the advice that the Zen master was giving me. I said, you're giving me the same advice that John of the Cross gives and that any Catholic spiritual director would give. Who, he said. I said, John of the Cross. Okay, how do you spell that? He said, John, J-O-H-N. -E oh, well, well, Cross. He spoke a little English. So he wrote that down. I'll have to look him up, he said. Never heard of him. And I discovered in this time that I was in the hermitage that the ascetical side of Zen meditation is very much like the whole Catholic tradition of it's John of the Cross is what it is. They're very similar. The whole thing about uh, John of the Cross is nada, nothing, nothing else, not being detached, uh, not having inordinate attachments, um, the whole thing. It, it's, they're very similar. The advice this Zen master gave me is exactly the advice I give to people that have similar things coming up in their own prayer. Just exactly. And he followed John of the Cross almost to the letter. And Teresa of Avila. So maybe their theory of Zen meditation is not as developed as Catholic theory of contemplative prayer. But it's the same, it goes along the same lines, it follows the same patterns, and the advice is the same. Is what I was what I was doing was that really valid? I mean, I didn't get my koan from a real Zen master in Korea or Japan. I got it from Jesus. Was that valid? Was it valid for me to be doing what I was doing, being in contact with Jesus really all the time, asking him this question? So you might say I was really doing a Catholic prayer, Christian prayer. But was it Zen? This Zen master seemed to think so. And every, all the masters I talked to seemed to think, sure, that was all right. I, admittedly, the Korean, Korean Zen is a little more flexible and less formalized than Japanese Zen. Japanese Zen, I mean, you've got all different aspects, not just meditation, but it's a whole way of life. You've got Zen gardens and the tea ceremony and swordmanship and horseback riding, all kinds of things, every, you name it. Zen, there's a Zen thing there. Like the tea ceremony. The Koreans, here, here's a little lore, you can impress your Buddhist friends with that, see, with this. The, the Japanese Zen tea ceremony, in many of its parts, opening and closing, is derived from the Catholic Mass. Did you know that? 
some of the Zen people went to China and discovered the Jesuit missionaries there saying mass and they thought that was cool you know the guy and so now the Zen ceremony the Japanese tea, Zen, Zen tea ceremony in Japan starts the way the priest used to come in before Vatican II very solemn right he's carrying the chalice puts on the chalice with the host takes off the whatever that thing used to be called puts it over here that's the beginning of the Japanese tea ceremony and the end of it is the same way they get a lot of it from the mass not the essential but the beginning and the end but it's very formal what do you think they do in the Korean tea ceremony give up I'll tell you they drink tea ha that's it <laughs> there isn't any ceremony the guy pours out the tea they call it a tea ceremony and, and there isn't anything about Zen gardens or flower arranging or swordsmanship I mean that doesn't even exist they're, they're more informal the idea of Korean Zen is not all this other stuff but just do it do the Zen meditation that's the important thing and I think that's good but aren't they aren't they atheistic Zen Buddhists in general are they praying to God so my Zen master the first day I met him he said do you believe in God I said yeah he said I don't oh I said what do you believe in he said I believe in the Buddha nature true mind oh all right so then uh, after a while and after doing a little reading I wish I could meet him again because if he said do you believe in God I'd say I believe in the Buddha nature and true mind it's the same thing I read uh, Shino I'll write his name down who is the founder of Korean Zen he got it together and laid down the practical and I'm running out of space theoretical framework Shino also called Ho Jo who is the founder of Korean Zen I read I read his he was about a little before uh, I think I guess it was the 15th 16th century so not all that long ago and I read him it's translated into English there are many many volumes and he explains what the true mind and Buddha nature is it's uh, the Buddha nature or true mind is the ground of everything so that everything really is somehow the Buddha nature and every creature is a manifestation of the Buddha nature and you might say that's pantheism except he adds that creatures change for example sentient beings living things they, they are born they live they die but the Buddha nature never changes but its manifestations change well I'm simplifying but that's the general idea what is that does anybody recognize it it's St. Thomas Aquinas's theology of creation who has a cigarette lighter or a match anyone no smokers here you got a cigarette lighter oh you're wonderful I'm going to use an audio visual aid <laughs> to show you St. Thomas Aquinas's theology of creation for Thomas Aquinas he doesn't consider creation as a uh, something that happened in the beginning he considers it as a relationship any Dominicans here okay so nobody no one will correct me if I'm wrong St. Thomas Aquinas the great Dominican theologian and the greatest theologian I believe in the whole Christian tradition he says that creation is a relationship in the creature and it's a relationship of creatureliness to God so that creation is now it's not just not in the beginning he's not talking about that by creation he means a relationship the relationship in you the relation in you to God as your creator and he's holding you in existence right now okay God is existence itself Thomas says so what does he do he gives existence and he holds you in existence and the analogy that Thomas uses is a flame here's a flame see that that can you see it it's a flame what does a flame do it burns 
it creates other flames so that I'm burning up my notes. Never had a professor do that before, did you? It communicates itself. And that's what God does. He communicates himself. He gives me existence continuously. He gives you existence continuously. That's what it means to be a creature. You are held in the palm of God's hand. And that means that it... Okay, out. Is there a fire hazard here? Yes. So, thank you for the lighter. Every time I meet any other person or any creature at all, the cigarette lighter, for example, I'm meeting up a flaming up of God. Isn't that beautiful? God is more present than you think, St. Thomas says. He's more present in creatures than they are to themselves because he's the one giving them their own existence. It's my existence. I'm autonomous, and I'm, I'm, I have a certain amount of freedom. I make my own choices within limits. But I'm a flaming up of God. That's very much like Chino. That's very much like Pocho. That's his idea of the Buddha nature. I believe that the Korean Zen Buddhists and all Zen Buddhists, I find the same thing in, uh, when I read D.T. Suzuki, the Japanese Zen uh, Buddhist, who popularized Japanese Zen in, uh, in English-speaking countries. It's the same idea. They say they don't believe in God. That means they don't believe in what we think, in what they think we mean by God. But they believe in the Buddha nature, which is precisely what we mean when we say the word God. I don't think Zen Buddhism is atheistic at all. There are philosophers at Kyoto University in Japan who are atheistic. But the people that are the practitioners, the monks and the nuns, because that's what we mean by the personalness of God, exactly what they mean. What really convinced me of this? Okay, this is subjective and maybe it's not very scientific. What convinced me is that Korean Zen monks and nuns live celibacy. They live. And I don't think it's possible without an interpersonal relationship with God. I don't think it's possible. And I don't think it's possible without grace. It's a miracle. Living celibacy, and I'm the first one to tell you maybe, but I know what I'm talking about, it's, it's walking on water. It's a miracle. If you live celibacy, that's a miracle. And God does that. You can't do it. You can't even fulfill yourself as a human being without having an intimate, uh, affective, of, in some way, relationship with another person. After all, that's why people get married, isn't it? To have an intimate relationship relationship with another, affective relationship with another person. That's the, we're created that way. A celibate, somebody in celibacy has that relationship with God. The, the person with whom I have an intimate, affective relationship in my life is Jesus Christ. That's who it is, God. And that is how I become, that, that responds to something in my own human nature and that's how, I, how I'm celibate. I think if I stopped praying, I wouldn't be celibate very long. Although at 70, it gets easier, believe me. <laughs> but we don't know yet. As, as my father said, when I was about 40, somebody said, isn't it wonderful he turned out so well? My father said, too early to tell. <laughs> it's still too early to tell. The Korean monks keep celibacy. They think they have a lot of problems, but they don't have as many problems as the Catholic Church does with its priests. So they've got to be getting grace. They've got to be getting the grace of celibacy. They must. I met them. I know them. They're great people. And they meditate for some hours every day at least. And when they're in retreat, they meditate all the time. What are they doing? They would say they're just meditating, and we don't want to describe it. I'm just doing my koan. Sure, they are. I think they're in touch with, an absolute, with the absolute. That's what they're in touch with, with the Buddha nature. And in my terms, from my Catholic point of view, and my Christian point of view, 
That's personal. They're persons, and that's personal. They got a union with the absolute. They've got a union with the supreme being. They don't want to call it that. That's okay with me. I'm going to call it that, and I'm sure that's what they have. And my, my evidence is their writings, but also the fact that the monks and the nuns do keep celibacy, and they keep it. Sure, they got their problems, but, I mean, nothing like ours, nothing like the Catholics, much less. And thousands and thousands of nuns and thousands of thousands of Zen monks are keeping celibacy, and they're meditating for hours every day. If that's not having some kind of an interpersonal relationship with, an, with the absolute, with God, then I don't know what it is. It's got to be that. Are we doing the same thing then in Christian contemplation and in Zen meditation? Well, maybe it's not so different. Maybe it's really not so different. What, does, what the Zen people tell me is that everything is nothing. It's all a void. Nothing exists. All right, if nothing exists, that's the same as saying everything that exists, exists. You can say nothing exists, but if you're attributing non-existence to everything, it's the same as if you attribute existence to everything. They say that the void, what, what, what do you meditate on? The void. Everything is nothing. I'm nothing, you're nothing, we're all nothing. It's the void. What's the void? The void is here. This is from a poem. I was reading this about a week ago, 10 days ago, and I thought, I think I'll recite this poem, but then I would, couldn't memorize it because I never was very good at that. So I Xeroxed it. This is Chris, Christmas Humphreys, who's a famous English Theravada Buddhist. Not a Zen Buddhist, but he's got the same idea of the void. Here's the poem. You ready for this? A little poetry? Don't say I didn't give you anything cultural. Okay. All is a thing which is not something else. All that is something else is also a thing. All things are void. The void, big V, is the name for an absence of all things. The void, big V, is also full. Full of no thingness only. What's that supposed to mean? The void is full of no thingness only. The void, what is it? It's not a thing. It's no thing. It's not, nothing. Nothing in the sense of no thing. It's the absolute. And of course it's not a thing. God is not a thing. He's beyond thingness. He's no thing, but he's full. He's full of what? Of nothingness, of no thingness. That's the void. And that's, as St. Thomas Aquinas would say, what all men call God, except the Buddhists don't call it God. They call it the void. They call it Buddha nature. They call it true mind. Same thing. I really believe that they're talking about the divine essence, which is the community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They haven't got the revelation of the Trinity, but they've arrived at, um, as people do, right, at the idea of a supreme, absolute being. There is a whole tradition in Christian contemplation, Catholic especially contemplation. Most of the Christian mystic mystical tradition has come down to us through the Catholic Church, partly through the Anglicans, partly through the Orthodox, partly through the Coptics, but mainly through the Catholics because Reformation Protestantism pretty well rejected mysticism and contemplative prayer at the time of the Reformation, but it's coming back in. It's coming back in because people are doing it. Okay, I said that last night. Within that, that Christian mystical tradition, there is a, a minor and, let's say, less populated strain of Christian contemplation that is very similar, conceptually even, to Zen Buddhism. It's represented by Meister Eckhart, in the uh, Middle Ages and by Thomas Merton today, who in fact was very influenced by Zen. It's the idea that uh, there, another thing that the Zen people use is they say that when I meditate, I'm in touch with my true self. 
What's my true self? My true self is the void. My true self is the Buddha nature. My true self is true mind. We would say God. This particular tradition, Meister Eckhart, down through a lot of people, up to Thomas Merton, would say that when I'm in contemplative prayer, I'm in touch with my true self. What's my true self? Myself in relationship with God. That's what I'm in touch with. Myself in relationship with God. There's something at my center, which is not a thing, which is God himself. My center is God. Am I God? No, I'm not. The distinction is infinite. But there's no dichotomy. God is nearer than I think. He's, more, he's closer to me. God is closer to me than I am to myself. And so in this particular uh, tradition of the Christian tradition of mystical prayer, of contemplative prayer, that's it. I'm in touch with my true self, which is myself, in relationship with God. And so my experience is not so much of God, but as of my union with him. Of my, what I experience is my union with God. Okay, it's a dark experience. It's a murky experience. It's, an exp it's a knowing without knowing. It's uh, uh, an experience of the void, really, because how can I experience and express in ordinary terms my union with God? It's a kind of a, a feeling of nothingness, of emptiness, of, uh, of zero. All right. Or as, uh, as my Zen master said, where you want to go in, in Zen meditation, I would say in Christian contemplation, you want to go out into, you come to a place that's kind of like a meadow and it's peaceful and it's flat and you stay there. That's true. That's what you do in Christian contemplation because that's where you find the Lord. Not in concepts, not in ideas, not in thoughts and not in words and not in images because the idea is union in Christian contemplation is union with God, not as I imagine him, but as he is in himself. And as he is in himself, I can't imagine him. I can't imagine even Jesus Christ. I can have a picture of him, but that's not him. I don't want to be in union with my picture of God. I don't want to be in union with my picture of Jesus. I want to be in union with Jesus, and I am. But that means that I have no images, and I have no concepts, and I have no words. In Zen meditation, they're in union with um, a, a Zen practitioner with some proficiency, is in union with the Absolute, with the Supreme Absolute, with what we call God. And does that feel like being in union with an ordinary person, like you or you or you or you? No, it doesn't, because it's unimaginable. It's beyond imagination. It's beyond conceptualization. And I can give it names, but the names don't mean anything. It's a reality, and it's the fundamental reality of everything. Well, as I said, it's a little hard to articulate. I did the best I can. I've spoken to several Catholic theologians that are expert in Zen, and I, I'm, I wrote down what they said as so far as I could remember. K.T. Karawaki, the Jesuit Zen master, does he think Christians can practice Zen? Sure, he thinks they can. But he says, Zen is not relational. It's not interpersonal. The only interpersonality in Zen is between the Zen master and the disciple. But there's no interpersonalness between the person doing the meditation and a supreme absolute like God. I disagree. I think there is in Zen. So I would disagree with K.T. Kadawaki on that. I talked to, uh, to Bill William Johnston, in fact, who's a good friend, and I've talked to him a non number of times. He's got a new book out called Mystical Theology. I highly recommend it. He, says, uh, he talks about Zen, and he talks about Christian contemplation. He thinks we can learn from Zen, but that it's not at all the same thing, not at all. So I disagree with that, too. The great historian of Zen Buddhism is Heinrich du Moulin, who is a Jesuit at Sophia University. And he's very sympathetic to Zen, but that's as far as it goes. 
And the fourth one, I talked to Sister Kim, Kim Sung Hae of Sogang University who teaches comparative mysticism at Sogang. I talked to her too. They have different views, maybe from mine, about Zen. But they all agree on this. That if a person is really is practicing Zen and doing it right, then, as a matter of fact, that person does reach transcendent truth with a capital T and a capital T. That person does reach transcendent truth. And I said to Sister Kim, I said, okay, let's call that God. She said, no, I prefer to stay with a terminology that's acceptable to Zen Buddhists. They would say that. They would say that, yes, they do have a relationship. They do reach, in Zen meditation, transcendent truth. Okay, call it what you want. I'm calling it God. For us, transcendent truth is God. For us, transcendent truth is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm reaching Jesus when I do Zen, and why not? A Zen practitioner is also reaching Jesus, but he doesn't know it's Jesus. He thinks it's, he's calling it the Buddha nature, true mind. All right, that's okay with me. Call it what you want. Maybe he doesn't, have, he doesn't have the revelation of the Trinity and of the Incarnation and of all the rest of it. But he's there. He's there with God. He's in what I would call <coughs> contemplative prayer. Okay, proviso. Here's the proviso. Two, two things, two questions. First of all, are all these people doing Zen, are they really in touch with God? And secondly, can Christians do Renzai Zen or Korean Zen? Answer to the first question. My experience is, and I get this from the Zen masters, there are a lot of people doing Zen that really don't, how to, don't know how to use a koan, that aren't doing it right, and they kind of give up on it after a while, and it doesn't work out, and so on. But that's true of Christian contemplation too, isn't it? So not everybody that says he's doing Zen is really doing Zen. I'm convinced, though, that the guys that are really doing it, yes, they're in what we would call contemplative prayer. Secondly, can a Christian practice sin? I think so. I really think so. But I think Soto Zen, I'm, I don't know. I, I can't get a handle on it. I mean, I, it's beyond me. Renzai Zen, either Japanese Renzai or Korean Zen, their form of Renzai. Can you practice a koan, especially an aggressive koan, a questioning koan? I think so. I think that that's a legitimate method. But I think it has to be directional. I think it has to have, uh, it has to be a question or, or uh, a riddle, a phrase, that has something to do with God, has something to do with the Lord and my relation to him. And I think that I have to direct that my meditation on that koan or on that wadu in either Japanese or Korean Renzai Zen, I think that has to be directed to God. Otherwise, I think you're thinking or you're meditating or you're doing something, but it isn't really, you're not really praying. You're not really doing something valid within the Christian tradition. For me, the whole point of all of this is to get to God, to be with the Lord, to be with the Lord, and to be in union with him. That's the point of Zen meditation and of Christian contemplation. And if it doesn't do that, do the Zen people do it? Yes, because I think that by questioning the koan and by meditating on the koan, they arrive at a, uh, eventually, at a, a non-conceptual intuition and intent of the will towards existence itself, towards transcendent existence itself, or if you will, to transcendent truth itself, and that's God. So I think they are in union with God. I think it's a lot easier for a Christian and much more valid to have a koan or a or a wadu or whatever, a koan or whatever you want to call it in Korean or Japanese, to have one that has something to do with the Lord or maybe something from the New Testament or a question, who are you or why do you love me or something. Well, I hate to tell you this, 
but I don't have a conclusion to the talk. That's it. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Everyone remains in total confusion. Yes. I have a feeling that this is not something you do, but something you become. You really do what you're saying. Yeah. It's not something you can car uh, put in a compartment. It's something God does, and you become. Ha! That's not bad. In fact, that's great. You want to write a book? <laughs> it's wonderful. Yes, I think that's true. Yes. That's true of both Christian contemplation and Zen meditation. They're just working two sides of the same street. That's all. You said uh, near the end of the talk that you think a Christian can do Zen. Yes. My question is, why would a Christian do Zen, Be given the gifts of Christianity as we see it, the Trinity, the perspective from right. which we try to reach transcendent truth? Right. That's, that's an excellent question, and it's, it's so obvious that a lot of people wouldn't have asked, why would a Christian want to do Zen, right? Because it works because that might be his ticket. For me, it works. Great. Works fine. That might be the way that the Lord wants him to go. It's an effective, uh, not so much a technique as a way of entering into relationship with the Lord. It's not for everybody. If, 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 if the Lord leads you that way, fine. If he doesn't, that's fine too. On the other hand, and I'm still responding to your question, just because a Christian does Zen, does that mean that he leaves all the rest of his Christian religion? Absolutely not. By no means. I, I still, I mean, I'm, I'm a famous, notorious, reactionary arch-conservative. People have called me names, but nobody ever called me unorthodox. At least not recently. So, it, you don't become less a Christian by using uh, something, some kind of prayer method or prayer approach from Eastern religions that helps you to be a better Christian. There was a letter from uh, Cardinal Ratzinger's office on this a couple of years ago. It was very criticized by experts, Catholic and Buddhist experts in Buddhism, in Zen Buddhism in particular, and also in Hinduism. It was criticized because they said that this instruction to Catholics about using uh, ways of, medi of Eastern meditation in Buddhism, for example, or Hinduism, the criticism was that the Holy Office, Cardinal Ratzinger's office in the Vatican, did not really understand uh, Buddhism and the various kinds of Buddhism, and that it didn't really understand Hindu meditation practices and their variety. Well, I suppose that criticism, up to a point at least, is valid. However, the point of the letter was to say, was not to, to promote understanding of other religious traditions or methods of prayer, but to say that, yes, Catholics could practice uh, the approaches to, uh, that, that the Eastern religions offer within certain parameters, and insofar as it helps. So I answered more than you asked me. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. This ought to be the last question because I just realized it's 11.15. Okay, shoot. Yes. That's the intercultural problem. Sure, a man like Dogon, which means the way of nothingness, that's his name, he was born in Vancouver, he was raised an Irish Catholic. Sure, he'd agree with me. But most people who are uh, 
the Korean people, the, the, my Zen master, I think I'd have to talk to him for a long time before we reached any understanding. But it's possible, if we talked a long time, that we would. I think I understand them better than most of them understand me, except the guys that were Roman Catholics and converted to Buddhism, which I'm not about to do. Thank you very much. God bless you. Uh, we'd like to just take a moment to thank you, Robert, for your, not only your insight, but the depth and the wealth of your experience. It, uh, it says something when somebody has gone through something as well as, as studied it, and we appreciate the richness of that. And um, just a reminder that the third talk in this series will be at 2 o'clock this afternoon here in Auditorium C. Thank you. God bless you. Did you understand it?